Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. My name is John Ragosta. I'm a historian here at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. And we're engaged in a number of studies and information gathering and educational processes involving Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonian era, sort of everything Jefferson. One of the most important things we do is we sponsor fellows from all over the nation and all over the world who come to Monticello to study about Jefferson and Jefferson related topics. Every year we have fellows both domestically and internationally. And one of the things that our fellows do for us is they have events like this where they get a chance to report to us and to other interested folks about the research they've been doing. So today we're very happy to have with us Stephen Lloyd. Stephen is the curator of the Darby Collection since 2012 and has responsibility for the art collection and the historian's library at the family estate and archives of the Earls of Derby in England. He also is previously the senior curator of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and the National Galleries of Scotland and Edinburgh. But most importantly for today's purpose, he is currently writing an art historical biography of Mariah Causeway. Now, Causeway, as many of you will know, was Jefferson's person of interest while he was in Paris. And maybe Stephen will fill us in on exactly what that relationship was. But Jefferson had many conversations, many outings, uh, many engagements with Causeway over his time in Paris. And she, of course, took on an outsized uh, image in his memories of Paris. So with that, I want to open it up to Stephen. Those of you that are listening, if you have questions, please, uh, in the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen, enter a question. And when Stephen is done with his presentation, we'll have a chance to come back to your questions. Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much, John. And it's uh, terrific to be here again uh, as a Jefferson Fellow uh, here at Kenwood at Monticello. I was here, uh, it seems, a long time ago, 20 years ago, before the Kenwood Library was built, and uh, indeed before the Monticello Visitor Center was built. So there have been a lot of changes here and obviously a huge amount of interpretation of the whole site at Monticello, which is really profoundly fascinating uh, and obviously ongoing. Um, so uh, also just wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, Susan Stein and Andrew Shaughnessy, both who've been uh, incredibly inspiring to me in my research. Uh, and it's been fantastic to see them here uh, in the last few weeks. But everyone here, the staff and the fellows have been so welcoming. So thank you to everyone. So uh, I have just come to uh, Virginia from Lombardy in Northern Italy, uh, where I helped open the first ever exhibition solely devoted to Maria Hadfield Cosway. Uh, she was born Hadfield, obviously married Richard Cosway, the artist. Uh, and the, uh, this is at the Fondazione Maria Cosway, uh, in Lodi, which is about 20 miles southeast of Milan in Lombardy, uh, where her great girls' school still survives and is still an educational institution after she founded it in 1812. Um, and there is this wonderful exhibition uh, which has been put on by the Fondazione, which I'm going to talk to you a bit about, uh, and then move obviously forward to talk about Maria Cosway herself and uh, as an artist. Um, which is uh, the focus of my research. So the exhibition opened on the 23rd of September and it runs just for just over two months till the 20, 27th of November this year. So uh, if you're in Italy, do make a very big effort to go and see it. Uh, check on their website uh, and it's um, uh, there with the opening hours uh, and there is a, 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 there is a very important uh, publication, uh, mostly in Italian, uh, of 450 pages uh, with a couple of uh, entries, uh, catalog uh, uh, essays and a series of catalog entries by myself and Susan Stein. But I'll talk a bit about that at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start the um, slideshow. And I'm hoping that that's going to move forward. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is the Fondazione Maria Cosway, 
in Lodi on a beautiful day on the 22nd of September. Uh, this vast building, it was the uh, monastery of the Padri Minimi. Uh, it's an 18th century building with 19th century re, uh, um, remodelings inside, or some of which you'll see shortly. Um, it's in the southeast corner of Lodi, and Lodi is a very important strategic uh, city uh, on the river Adda, which flows into the Po. So we're in the very low, uh, the great rice growing area around Milan in the upper Po Valley. And so it's a very agriculturally very prosperous um, and immensely strategic important because of its crossing uh, of the Adda. And in fact, Napoleon fought his critical battle here in 1796 with the French army of the Directory, which he won, of course, and that was opened the gates to, um, to Milan and then the conquest of Italy. So the, uh, the, the, uh, in Lodi last year was a really uh, important exhibition on the battle itself, and Maria Cosway uh, featured in that exhibition because of her very, very interesting connections with the Bonaparte family, which I'll touch on uh, a bit later. So you're seeing there the entrance, you're seeing the north entrance from the street, the Paolo Gorini number 10, uh, into through the exhibition panel there, Maria Hadfield Cosway was the title of the exhibition. And you're seeing those windows on the first floor that are looking out onto the street. Those are the library, the gallery, uh, and the leading into the chapel. And at the far end of the street is the uh, church of Santa Maria della Grazia, where Maria Cosway is buried. Um, and I'll show you some images of that right at the end. So uh, without further ado, just going ahead. And here we have the actual entrance door with uh, the president of the Fondazione Maria Cosway, which was founded in 1978 when the, the school of the Collegio della Grazie or the Instituto de Santissima Maria Bambina uh, 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 became a Catholic foundation uh, run by the Dami Inglesi, the English women. Uh, was dissolved in 1978, it became a, a foundation. And uh, so the um, Lodigiani, the people of Lodi have run the foundation. So uh, members of um, the community, both chemists uh, and clerics and uh, uh, administrators and bankers. And uh, so this is really the first time that the, uh, the institution has been open to the public. And as you go in, you come to this first staircase and you see uh, these two images you see the uh, coronet there on the staircase of mc the monogram with the baroness's crown because maria cosway uh, was made a baroness of the austrian empire for her services to the education of young girls in lombardy in italy uh, in 1835 and again i'll touch on this a bit later one of the wonderful things about the exhibition which really makes it very unique is that the liceo um, artistico calisto piazza uh, in Lodi has designed the exhibition and the catalogue and with the students of this art school they have done a really extraordinary job in reimagining both Maria Cosway and her context and what that extraordinary object is over the staircase is a huge straw interpretation of one of Maria Cosway's hats uh, with ribbons uh, and it just gives you an insight into there are also extraordinary costumes that are reinterpreted from Maria Cosway's lifetime. All the design is done by the students, the catalog uh, and other many other aspects of the interpretation of the exhibition, including QR codes and, um, uh, and uh, prints as well from inspired by uh, artwork in the exhibition. So you go upstairs and then you come into the chapel, which actually dates from the 1850s. Uh, so it's a later, after because Maria Cosway died in 1838, uh, aged 78, born in 1760 in Florence, to English parents. Um, and you're seeing that the chapel is decommissioned, but you're seeing the text panels, you're seeing costumes, you're seeing display cases, and there are other rooms nearby uh, where uh, other relics and heirlooms and part of the inheritance uh, of Maria Cosway's gift uh, as well as a substantial financial foundation was made to her own school and to, uh, to the Dami Inglesi, to the English women who ran it then for the next 130 years. And this slide actually shows one of the ancillary rooms, and you're seeing how that the paintings in Maria Cosway's collection, some of which were her own, some were her husband's, uh, who was a great art collector, one of the great artist collectors of the late 18th and early 19th century, are displayed. 
Um, and you're seeing uh, Francesco Chiaroli, the president of the foundation, talking to the Anglo-Italian uh, actor Greta Scacchi, who played uh, Maria Cosway in the Merchant Ivory film from 1995, Jefferson in Paris. And I'll be very happy to talk about that. She came to Lodi in 1994 to do spend a week researching uh, in the uh, archives uh, and seeing all the heirlooms, and that really inspired her to, to recreate Maria Cosway in that very beautiful but rather uh, controversial film. And then you're seeing one of the desk cases here with miniatures and drawings from the archive. There are over 700 of Richard Cosway's drawings in the collection, and there are about 50 of Maria Cosway's, but as many of prints by her and paintings by her and books and uh, other artifacts from her life in London and also from in Italy. So it's a really extraordinary inheritance that's been preserved by both the school and then by the Fondazione. Um, but it's uh, hitherto it's been fairly unknown because access to the uh, Fondazione and to the uh, monastery has been uh, obviously quite limited and, and still is, but special access has been granted obviously for this exhibition. Now here is Maria Cosway. And this drawing, which emerged, which is by Richard Cosway, by her husband, they married in 1781. As you can see from the verso from the back, it's, it's, a, it's, it's pencil on paper on the back signed by Richard Cosway. He made the drawing himself, dated anno 1785. So they've been married four years. She's, she's uh, 25, he's 12 years older than her. Um, and he's also written at the top, Maria Luisa Caterina Cecilia Cosway. Um, and that is her full name. And she was the was one of the younger children who was born to the innkeeper Charles Hadfield uh, in Florence, one of the most important uh, uh, hotels and inns and taverns for grand tourists, which gives you some sense of the extraordinary education that Maria Cosway, Maria Hadfield as she was, uh, had in Florence. And this extraordinary drawing, there are many portraits by Richard Cosway of his wife. I mean, he was fascinated by her, by her, uh, her intelligence, by her sophistication, both as an artist and a musician, and obviously her beauty. Uh, and she, she was a prime model for her husband. But this of all the portrait drawings is quite small. It's only about three inches by two. It's really a miniature. Um, shows the, the look, the gaze, um, that very intense gaze uh, with this extraordinarily beautiful face that captivated so many uh, of her contemporaries, both male and female. And it has to be said that Jefferson was just one of many, but that will be something we can discuss later. Um, so it, it, this was engraved, uh, like many of these uh, portraits by uh, her husband, um, in 1791 by, in Stipple by Luigi Schiavonetti. So many of these intimate, more informal uh, drawings were in, engraved in the highly fashionable Stipple engraving, really popularized by the Italian Stipple engraver, which is a, a dot and uh, dot technique uh, by really popularized by Francesco Bartolozzi, an Italian engraver, hugely successful, worked with Robert Adam uh, and Giovanni Battista Cipriani in London and Angelica Kaufman too. So this gives you some sense of the, uh, uh, the very fertile artistic and cultural uh, print market as well as design market uh, around the time of the foundation of the Royal Academy in 1768. And Cosway, Richard Cosway, became an associate in 1770 and later a full academician in 1771. Again, we'll come to that shortly. So just some more, just to introduce Maria Cosway, here are some more. Uh, on the left, we have, uh, again, it also emerged on the art market only a few years ago, actually only a couple of years ago, this very beautiful um, drawing, pencil drawing with watercolor by Richard Cosway, showing his wife Maria in about 1785. So about a year before they make their, their famous visit to Paris when uh, Maria and Richard meet uh, Thomas Jefferson when he's American ambassador in Paris. So they're at the, really at the beginning of their height of their fame in the, in the, in the 1780s when he becomes the main court painter to the Prince of Wales, later the Prince Regent and King George IV. And she's shown here seated in the ground in a, in a park with this fantastic uh, uh, hat with the S curve of the, um, of the straw hat with the ostrich feathers, obviously a, a reference and nod to the Prince of Wales's ostrich feathers, which is one of the symbols of his crest. 
And, uh, but it's, it's really inspired by Peter Paul Rubens, uh, his own self-portrait with his wife, um, which is now in the Alta Pinacothek in, in Munich. And we'll see another interpretation a bit later. On the right is a fascinating, this is a self-portrait drawing with watercolor by Maria Cosway for what we thought was a lost self-portrait. She did a number of self-portraits. We'll see another one shortly. Uh, it's with her color notes. You can see on the right, there's the phrase Bigio, which means gray. And she's pointing to, she's pointing to herself to gray. And this is a study for her self-portrait of 1785, which has just recently re-emerged in a private collection. Um, and again, she's showing herself as Rubens' great model, his sister-in-law, Suzanne uh, uh, Formont, uh, uh, sister of his wife, uh, his second wife, Hélène Formont, the very famous painting by Rubens with, this, with the straw hat in the um, National Gallery in London. Um, and it shows, you can see Richard Cosway here and quite differently from the previous drawing with a very intense gaze here. She's very much acting the model very much in a 17th century style, part of the fancy dress that Cosway liked to prom promote his wife in um, at this date in the, in the orbit of the court of, um, of um, the Prince of Wales, later Prince Regent, King George IV. Now this is the fundamental statement of self-portrait by Maria Cosway. This is her, this is Valentine Green's Mexican tint engraving. This is the very dark manner uh, engraving equally popular both in Britain and, and in Europe, along with Stipple, uh, showing uh, after a lost self, untraced self-portrait by Maria Cosway with her powdered hair, her uh, turban, with her black choker with the heart at the neck and the, and the cross um, below at her breast. And that is a reference to her very overt Catholicism, which was an absolutely fundamental uh, signature of her uh, being, of her belief, and really it, 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 it came to the fore many times in her life and certainly dominated the second part of her life when she became an educationalist of young girls. A uh, very dark background, uh, hinting to the, the, I would say, to the, the uh, romantic sublime in her work um, and very much inspired by Henry Fusli, the great Swiss artist who famously did The Nightmare, we'll come to him a bit later. And what's fascinating about this is the crossed arms, which is so unusual for self-portraiture. Normally with self-portraiture, you have uh, the palette, you have the, um, the brushes, the paint brushes at hand. There's some reference to her as an artist. Here, there is no reference to her as an artist. And this has led to a number of interpretations, whether it's a, it's a pose of confident self-assertion or a pose of she's sending a message that she feels um, uh, inhibited as an artist. She's not allowed to act professionally, to rank professionally. She does write in a let, let, letter to her late husband's cousin later in life, a very important letter. Um, and that's also worth discussion. But this, there's a lot more to say about this, this um, self-portrait engraving of this, of this lost self-portrait. Now to go back to Maria Cosway, her career obviously starts in Florence in the 1760s and 1770s. She's a musical prodigy. She's extremely talented singer uh, and harpist and keyboardist. And that is a great feature of her whole uh, adult youth and her adult life. I mean, she, she's, uh, she's educated in the convent of the Visitazioni in, uh, in Florence, but also she's performing at the Austrian court in Florence at this time. So she has tremendous encouragement from her own uh, mother and father. Um, and also she's meeting all the, the many of the grand tourists coming to, particularly British and Irish, coming to Florence on their way to Rome and Naples. Uh, and they're staying in the, had, the, the in, in Carlos, Charles Hadfield's in three inns in and around Florence. Florence. So how does she train? Because of course it's really difficult for women artists, they're not allowed to join academies, though Maria Cosway is elected to the Academia, the Academy in Florence in 1778, a remarkable achievement for an 18 year old. So she's copying old master paintings in both the Uffizi galleries and in the Palazzo Pitti, the two great Florentine galleries formed by the Medici. And this is an absolutely beautiful copy done when she was 16. It's a full scale copy of the large Cooper Madonna by Raphael in the, um, now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And this was at the time when it was in the, 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 the German painters, Johann jo Zoffany's collection, who was in Florence at the time, uh, and painting the famous um, Tribuna, the Tribune of the Uffizi with the Grand Tourists. Um, and this is in the collection at Lodi with its original frame. Uh, it, it's in superb condition as well. And so you can see that she's a, she has this incredible talent as a copyist. 
Now, of course, she's not able to study in the life class and she doesn't, as far as we know, she's not even copying plaster, plaster cast. So she certainly could have in the tribuna of the Uffizi. But if we now just look at what's going on in, with her contemporaries in London, here is Zoffany's very famous view of the Academy of the Royal Academy in London, painted in a few years earlier, 1771 to 1772. Uh, and you see you here with the, the um, Gaslitch uh, chandelier, you can see the, the two uh, models, male models, of course, with all the plaster casts in the background with all the Royal Academicians, just only two years after the Royal Academy has been founded. Uh, there is Joshua Reynolds in the black suit in the middle to the left with his hearing aid. He was hard of hearing. Zoffany seated on the front lower left with his palette and brushes. Behind him standing looking rather uh, uh, pleased with himself is Benjamin West, the American painter who later becomes the president of the Royal Academy after Joshua Reynolds. And then moving across to the far right, the very um, flamboyant figure with the cane resting on the nude uh, plaster cast of a woman uh, with, the, with the tricorn hat and the fancy waistcoat. And you can just make out the sword is Richard Cosway, who's just become a member of the full member of the Royal Academy. And if you notice, he's the only, they're all men, of course, uh, he, he's the only member of the Academy of the Artists who's actually posturing, who's posing. He's adopting the pose of the Apollo Belvedere, the very, very famous sculpture in the Vatican, uh, which had been discovered uh, just around 1500 and was an absolute must on the grand tour. And there above, I do point you out to the top right-hand corner, the two paintings unfinished by Zoffany. On the left is Angelica Kaufmann, the famous Austrian uh, 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 artist who came to Italy, then to London, and was a huge sensation and you know, one of the most famous women artists of the 18th century, together with Elizabeth Fiji Lebrun in Paris, both of whom were known to Maria Cosway. Uh, and then to her right in profile is Mary Moser, who was a very distinguished uh, uh, flower painter, and one of her paintings is at, at Lodi. And in fact, her Royal Diploma, Royal Academy Diploma, is also at at Lodi, together with Richard Cosway. Maria Cosway uh, never became a Royal Academician. George III insisted that Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser were made members, though they weren't allowed to join the, uh, the uh, life class. Um, and uh, Angelica Kaufman went to, back to Rome in 1781, but was able to encourage Maria Hadfield and then later Cosway after her marriage briefly when she was in London. So this is an incredible insight, obviously, into the practice of our artistic training uh, and how artists presented mm -hmm. themselves uh, in, the, in, the, in the life class, which is a fundamental part of the Royal Academy. So now here is, uh, at Lodi, is this extraordinary drawing, a large drawing start of life, from Life Sketch on the left by Richard Cosway of Angelica Kaufman playing the guitar. And it must date from 1780 to one, just before, just when Maria Hadfield had arrived in London and just before um, um, Angelica Kaufman finally goes back to Italy. Uh, she's really at the height of her fame in London. Um, and as I said, she's a really, really important figure for encouraging uh, the young Maria uh, had for when she arrives in London in 1779 after her father dies and her mother decides to bring the whole family uh, to, to London. They're really dependent on Maria Cosway, uh, both establishing her career as an artist and a musician and making a good marriage. Um, and then she's being touted as the next Angelica. Um, and on the right there, there we have this painting that survives in Lodi, one of the rare paintings of by a flower piece is still lives by Mary Moser. Um, and she was a great friend of, of uh, Maria Cosway's and, and also of Richard Cosway's. So women artists are very important to Maria Cosway um, and, she, and women patrons as well. And uh, as I mentioned before, she has an incredible uh, ability to make friendships, not just across Britain, uh, but across Europe and, and of course in America too, the young America. And what we're seeing here, two drawings by Richard Cosway showing the Anne Seymour Damer, who was a remarkable woman who was a sculptor um, and not in the Academy, um, a member of the aristocracy uh, and related to Horace Walpole, who greatly encouraged her, a great connoisseur and collector and writer um, at Strawberry Hill. And this amazing uh, from life ad vivum sketch on the left, showing her actually in the process of um, uh, carving the marble. Um, and you're seeing there on the right, a more, I would say a, a study uh, of her more 
turned into a much more elegant study. And this is a preparation for a print that Richard Cosway produced for Walpole in 1790 from a finished drawing. Um, but it's a, it really is a, uh, it's a powerful indicator of, of, of the importance of women artists, both in the circle of the Cosways and Horace Walpole. Uh, and she's really it's leaps and bounds the most important female sculptor working in England and Britain in the 18th century. Um, Cosway, Richard Cosway himself, just a little bit on him, we'll, we'll, um, uh, he, was, he, was, he was from Devon, born in 1742, came to London in the mid-1750s, won a lot of prizes at the Society of Arts, so had a, uh, from a very low upbringing, he, um, he really did really climb the ladder of success, really through his tenacious hard work and his brilliance as a, as a draftsman and a miniaturist. He was very short himself, only five foot, and we believe Maria Cosway was the same height. So here he is being caricatured by Matt Darley as the miniature macaroni. Matt, the macaronis were the fops who'd been to Italy, though Richard Cosway, so Italianate in so many ways, never actually went to Italy. Um, that's 1772. And Cosway's is exhibiting at the Society of Arts his oil paintings, his miniatures, which he's most famous for, his drawings. And when he shows at the Royal Academy in 1770, he shows this very ambitious uh, uh, conversation piece, but in in the full-flown grand manner that was being popularized by Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was trying to bring this um, uh, French and Italian Academy uh, um, uh, impetus to the newly found Royal Academy in London. It was exhibited as fortitude of introducing a, a hope to distress, and it's a, a group portrait of the Wicks family with Minerva in sh shade. It's uh, obviously he has died, and that is his sister and his wife. Um, and uh, it's in the Tate Gallery. So he has, he's a very ambitious painter, and this is the picture that really gets him uh, into the Royal Academy as a full uh, academician. It's a very, it's, a, it's an allegory, it's a bit overblown, but it's, 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 it's full of uh, melancholy, quite successfully done. And this actually is something that Maria Cosway is, after their marriage, is very interested in herself, this mood, um, particularly influenced by Fusli, as I said. Um, two more prints of Cosway after a self-portrait on the left. Uh, you can see this extraordinary dress that he adopted, this fancy dress in the circle of the Prince of Wales. Uh, that's probably from the late 1780s on the left. And then early 1790s, he's uh, in more sober dress here. This is uh, Danielle's print after George Nance's drawing in the Royal Academy. Um, um, he was much mocked and uh, because of his extravagant talk and his, ex his extraordinary dress, uh, his eccentric religious beliefs, uh, but all the time he was just creating this extraordinary career as a miniaturist and draftsman and artist and collector connoisseur. Um, it was a kind of extraordinary mask that he 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 put up to um, to disguise, really, for some reason in his psychology to disguise his true intentions. Um, so. Uh, he's a complicated character, and the marriage between the Cosways is, is a very difficult one to understand. It's not a, a simple issue, as so many Jefferson scholars have liked to make out. And in fact, they've fallen into many traps in trying to understand that, that marriage in the 1780s and later. Um, there is the Prince of Wales on the left after Cosway, after many, many of the miniatures that uh, were painted um, by the artist of his patron. Uh, this is uh, uh, often again with this late 16th, early 17th century dress, wearing the Order of the Garter. And the circle of the Cosways, and this includes Maria, is full of the most extraordinary people. I mean, have their musical salons in Schomburg House in London, in Pall Mall, include all the diplomats and spies going in London. And Walpole and Boswell cannot resist going. And uh, they talk about these extraordinary gatherings, these musical concerts, uh, some of which were attended by the extraordinary figure on the right, who is La Mademoiselle Le Chevalier Deon de Beaumont, notorious French transvestite mason spy uh, in Paris, expelled from, uh, in London, expelled from Paris. Um, and uh, uh, she was, a, she, she had been, when she was a he, she had, he had been a soldier and did public fencing matches uh, at Carlton House, um, Prince George's residence, not far from the Cosway. So you get a sense of this extraordinary uh, ambience around the Cosways. They really became the talk of the town, extremely successful. Their celebrity kind of, kind of merged together to create this, uh, what you might call one of the first celebrity couples and people wanted to be seen at their salon and at their concerts. She had all the top Italian opera singers performing, Tenducci, Marchese, Rubinelli, uh, she, she knew all of them and performed with them uh, privately at these uh, musical salons. 
Um, the Cosways, this is an example of Richard Cosways miniatures. This is the, uh, Edward Stanley, the 12th Earl of Derby, again in fancy dress from the late uh, 1780s. And there, his second wife, the great comic actress, Eliza Farron, uh, adopting the pose of the comic muse Thalia. And then there's a sense of Cos Richard Cosway's own drawing. Uh, and this is one of his great masterpieces from the Hero and Meander series. This is the dream of Hero uh, adopting the tomb of Ari the sculpture of the famous classical sculpture of Ariadne with her sleeping muse taken from Michelangelo and from the Sistine ceiling, the Cupid uh, in this uh, overheated, uh, um, intense classical, neoclassical interior with the dream of beached whale, which signifies the forthcoming death by drowning of Hero, um, I'm sorry, of Leander crossing the Hellespont. And this is uh, uh, also uh, this kind of drawing, I think one has to look at very carefully by her husband to see what Maria Cosway is, is doing in her, own, in her own compositions. Though they are together in this famous drawing at Lodi uh, of, uh, of self-portrait by Richard Cosway with Maria Cosway based on the famous Rubens in Munich, which I just referred to. And this is 1786. So this is how the Cosways would have appeared in, in Paris when they went and made this diplomatic very high level diplomatic mission on behalf of the uh, Prince of Wales to the Duke d'Orléans. We don't quite know what this was about, but it, that was, he was, he ended up painting the children of the Duke d'Orléans later, Philippe Galate. Um, and uh, he wasn't really acting as an artist. He was just acting as a, a as an, uh, as an agent for the uh, for the Prince of Wales. This was at a time when there was rapprochement between uh, England and France, where three years before the revolution, uh, and even David, the great uh, 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 history painter, is really keen to exhibit one of his works, The Death of Socrates in London. So, and Cos the Cosways are part of these negotiations. On the right is this, again, self-portrait by, by Rich Cosway with his wife, Maria, a definitive image, 1789, the year of the revolution, the year she becomes pregnant, um, and described as portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Cosway. Second impression, the second state, the first state is titled Portraits of Abelard and Eloisa. Uh, and they had, a, the Cosways had a, had a kind of obsession with this great um, study of 18, these great figures from uh, medieval France, but reinterpreted so, um, fashionably in both London and Paris and elsewhere in Europe in the 18th century. Um, and uh, uh, it's fascinating in this Van Dyck pose, the way that Cosway, Richard Cosway takes a step down to present his wife. So he's very much, uh, it's very much an artistic couple. And I think this has been underplayed in uh, all the accounts actually of the Cosways. Um, and that needs a, a, really a revising because Maria Cosway's career does depend on Richard Cosway, even though she does forge her own path. Um, and eventually they do separate, um, but uh, they do uh, come back together at the end of their life. So, um, uh, and she is devoted to her husband at the, in the last part of her life and his life. Um, there they are again, 1789, self-portrait by Richard Cosway in the Temple of the Arts with the bust of Rubens and, and uh, uh, Michelangelo, uh, dressed as, as a Van Dyck in courtier with the, uh, it, but in, in, in a melange of 16th and 17th century dress and the Cupid of Genius drawing the uh, S-curve of beauty on the, on the artist's palette, an extravagant and extraordinary self-portrait with a Solomonic twisting column in the background and, and a piece of um, elaborate early 18th century um, Baroque English furniture, which we think may survive in the Victorian Albert Museum. The, that piece emerges again on the right hand uh, pen and ink drawing. They're both at Lodi showing this uh, chest with the organ and the bust of Leonardo and the caryatid of Minerva behind Maria Cosway in Richard Cosway's portrait of her with that extravagant uh, uh, hat and uh, feathers and this amazing cloak and just pointing to a book of music. And of course, it's alluding to both of her skills as an artist and musician and Leonardo, the great artist of her native town, uh, Florence. So Maria Cosway herself as an artist. So one of the problems with Maria Cosway is that she exhibited 30 paintings in the Royal Academy in the 1780s and she had tremendous success and most of them were engraved. And you can see there the very famous Georgina Duchess of Devonshire, which caused a sensation when it was exhibited at the, at the Royal Academy in her um, first year of, of exhibiting in 1781. And there's the painting, it's large scale, full scale portrait of Georgina Duchess of Devonshire, the leader of the Bon Ton Society uh, and a patron of Richard Cosway at this moment and about obviously to support Maria Cosway as Cynthia or Diana flying through the air 
um, taken from Spencer's Fairy Queen. Uh, and of course, it's it's part of the grand manner portraiture, exp, exp, you know, proposed by uh, by um, Joshua Reynolds. But here it really takes off, and it's a very um, it's an incredibly ambitious uh, idea by Maria Cosway, uh, and it's a very dramatic painting, especially since it was cleaned. It's at Chatsworth, belongs to the Duke of Devonshire in Derbyshire, and it uh, it's it's on it hangs now on one of the internal corridors. Uh, upstairs and it's on the public route and it, it is still very very dramatic the painting has suffered in terms of condition and um it does oh, there are also problems with maria cosway's paint handling as well but she had the best engravers um uh, promoting her work and in particular valentine green produced a series of uh high quality mezzotint uh engravings throughout the 1780s when she was at her peak and also when she was exhibiting in the from her works exhibited paintings in the 1790s, 1796 and 1800 and 1801. Uh, and these did a great deal to promote her reputation and were much commented on as well in the press. There was a lot of hostility to women artists and Maria Cosway took a great deal of, as we would say now say trolling in the press, a really vicious um, uh, sexual harassment. Uh, 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 and this were, these were attacks that were both attacking both Richard Cosway and Maria Cosway within the circle of the Prince of Wales. Obviously there was a lot of hostility to Prince of Wales because of his extravagance and his um, uh, conduct of his personal life um, and the Cosways were rather unfairly swept up in that but you know if you ride with the devil um, and but the uh, uh, but we can see that Maria Cosway is also forging her own style and she's clearly encouraged by her husband to exhibit at the Royal Academy and also to work with the top engravers in London including Francesco Bartolozzi the stipple engraver now, what's a wonderful thing here about coming to Monticello and Kenwood this, this month is that there's been a great gift of Maria Cosway's prints to the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. And this is a unique print, of one of her lost paintings. Most of her paintings are lost, and this one is lost. And it shows Aeolus uh, summoning up uh, a storm from, uh, obviously from Virgil's Aeneid. Um, and it's one of those paintings, including the Deluge and, the, and Samson, um, uh, the, and obviously this one, Elis, that are, were really heavily criticized, that were exhibited by Maria Cosway in the mid 1780s in the Royal Academy. Of course, the figure of Elis is, is, is kind of preposterous. Uh, you could argue, you could see the four uh, winds blowing as well in various points of the composition. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't work as a composition. It's clearly heavily inspired by Henry Fusley, who hated the fact that he had these followers like Maria Cosway because of this the sense of the horror and terror and was, was so fashionable at this time. Think of uh, Fusley's The Nightmare, um, in particular, The Three Witches from Macbeth, of which there is a, play, a, a first date impression at the Fondazione Cosway in Lodi. It's the only print by after Henry Fusley in Mexican that's at, that survives that in Lodi, which is really interesting in itself. Um, but, uh, and there was a savage satire of the Cosways um, that included a reference to this painting and to Samson and to the Deluge. And Horace Walpole was particularly critical of these, these um, attempts mm -hmm. to, uh, to create compositions that were inspired by Fusley. And not surprisingly, Fusley was, was irritated. Maria Hadfield had met um, uh, Fusley in Italy, so uh, they had encountered each other in the previous decade. Um, here's one of the uh, stippling engravings by um, by uh, uh, Bartolozzi after Maria Cosway, showing the hours. Hugely successful print, one of her most successful compositions, not engraved till 1788, but shown at the Academy in 1784. There you have the 12 hours. Uh, again, Maria Cosway's own conception, but very much based on Guido Reni's famous Aurora, uh, uh, which was widely copied from in, in Rome and, and other copies were available in, in, in England itself. Uh, Northumberland House for one, uh, with dawn and dusk at each end, um, and the and the putty above. Um, Maria Cosway uh, uh, sent a copy of this to Jacques Louis David, who she'd met in Paris the previous year, and they become very friendly. And he wrote an extraordinary letter to her. Unfortunately, it's lost. Uh, it's written in February 1788. It is printed in a biography of Richard Cosway in the, and Maria Cosway by Williamson in 1897, who very warmly describes. Um, encourage, I'm seeing this and receiving the gift of the print encourages Maria Cosway onto glory, onto glory, because that is what you have. And he, uh, they renew their friendship uh, at various points later, though that becomes complicated after the revolution. Um, 
So this is very different style, though uh, very much based on the classical style, but you, there's this sense, a very strong sense of movement in her composition. At seen at its greatest, of course, in the Georgiana Duchess of Devonshire, which Walpole described as extravagant, which is a kind of barbed term for him of, of, of criticism. Um, now, one of the prints here at, again, another one here of the Maria Cosway, the recent gift um, to, the, um, from, uh, to the Thomas Jefferson Foundation is this unique colored, um, uh, stipple by Walker of a, of a Persian uh, approaching, worshipping the sun. And uh, it, these, these, because these, uh, prints in Metzitin were sold and in stipple were sold as coloured and were much more expensive than the monochrome, most of the monochrome survived. Uh, and in fact, this does seem to have hand, uh, hand colouring on it, which was probably by Valentine Green, but it's not unbelievable that it might be by Maria Cosway herself. This was a uh, a commission for the Dowager um, Lady Littleton, Elizabeth, who was a great friend of Maria Cosway and supporter. Uh, and it's been discussed by Diane Boucher and recently in, a, in an article in the Burlington Magazine. Uh, it's a very obscure subject indeed, um, and uh, it may well involve Indian iconography, um, but I will move on from this, uh, but it's just one of the, the exceptional uh, prints after Maria Cosway here at Monticello. Um, here we come to Jefferson, and this is the frontispiece by etched by Maria Cosway after Richard Cosway. This is the frontispiece for the published book of songs and and um, uh, that Maria Cosway, uh, after Maria Cosway's own compositions, are mainly Italian in Italian with music and verse for the harp and for voice for two voices that uh, she had printed. A number of copies survive. Quite a few of them are here in American libraries, and she sent it to Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, uh, and. Um, he, of course, had great musical interests himself. And so the title of the print is Amor Omnia Vincit, uh, Love Conquers All the Cupid, um, Playing the Pipes, Brings the Lion to Sleep. Um, it's, a, it's a charming and sentimental image, uh, very typical of the, some of the work that Richard Cosway was producing at the stage. He does have his own vein of, of sublime terror and horror, but generally he, uh, with his non-portraiture work, he does tend towards the more decorative uh, and the, hence his great uh, uh, working relationship with Francesco Bartolozzi and Cipriani earlier in his career in the 1770s and 80s. Um, so this is, and now we come to Jefferson himself, and this is him on the left. This is not the Trumbull uh, little miniature in oil on panel, which he, which was uh, begged for by Maria Cosway in 1787 and eight after the second visit um, to make up for his absence in fact, it's the one that was done at the same time. Uh, the, orig the original was at Lodi for till the 1970s. Uh, it's now in the White House in Washington. And there's a long story behind that. And there won't be time to tell you that. Um, uh, but at the same time as he was painting this, uh, his uh, Trumbull was painting this portrait taken obviously from the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he was also painting another version. This one you're seeing for Angelica Schuyler Church, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, and it's almost identical. Uh, again, oil on panel. Uh, and they were both admiring. They were both admirers of, uh, of, of Jefferson as much as he was of them. They were part of this circle, the two, the, these two women. Um, and the, head, the famous letter, the dialogue of the head and the heart, which was written after the end of, as you all know, after the uh, two-month two visit by the Cosways to Paris and uh, Trumbull introduces Jefferson to the Causeways in the Allo Blade, the wheat, the dome, um, extraordinary building of the wheat, uh, uh, um, uh, the grain in Paris, which Jefferson was so admired, so admired, um, but he was bold, he was smitten on first sight by meeting Maria. And then this extraordinary episode where in the next 14 days, Jefferson abandons all his diplomatic business and spends 12 days on half day and full day outings by carriage in his carriage with Maria Cosway, often on her own, sometimes with Trumbull, who was the, um, obviously in the Jefferson circle and his secretary, William Short, and sometimes with Richard Cosway as well. And they traveled all over Paris and to all the gardens and chateaus around Paris. Um, and also they went to the opera and to the, uh, uh, together as well, and to the ballet. So it's an extraordinary episode. Trumbull, as you know, from his diary, um, removed the, the, the two weeks where they were together and said that there was, um, his memory had failed him at that point. And make of that what you will. Of course, Jefferson fell completely in love with her um, and Maria Cosway enjoyed the attention and, and Richard Cosway was, was busy with the uh, Orléans commissions 
um, and uh, joined certainly joined them uh, later. They were, um, and then Jefferson broke his wrist in an unexplained accident in the Tuileries Gardens, uh, and then the Cosways left a few weeks later. Um, Maria Cosway came back to Italy, on, back, sorry, back to Paris on her own for four months, where she stayed with Princess Isabella Lubomirska, head of the. Polish community in exile in Paris, but the Jeff Jefferson and Maria Cosway were not able to rekindle their, what you might call it, a romance um, or friendship, um, because she was, Maria Cosway was so celebrated and she was in the circle of Lubomirska and Jefferson was so busy himself. Um, but they corresponded um, uh, and to the rest of their lives, and as you know about, they particularly in the second half uh, after Jefferson retired from the presidency, of course, was wanting to tell Maria all about the newly founded University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and Maria Cosway wanted to tell Jefferson all about her famous girls' school, uh, uh, the Collegio delle Dame Inglesi uh, in Lodi. So uh, it is a remarkable friendship, and with this dominated by this uh, this elaborate uh, performance of a letter, eleven pages written over five days by Jefferson in great pain with his left hand, having broken his right wrist in this. What must have been a, an unfortunate accident with possibly with Maria Cosway present. Um, and on the right is not Maria Cosway, it's an etching by her after a portrait of her, which is, sorry, it's etching by Dominic Vivant Denon a few years later done in Venice of the great Venetian uh, salon hostess um, Isabella Tiotocchi uh, Albrizzi, who numbered Byron and Foscolo in her and Canova in her great circle. Um, and Maria Cosway stayed with her in, in Venice in 1791. Uh, but it just again, the thing to say about this portrait in one of the letters to Jefferson that Maria Cosway uh, writes to Angelica Schuyler Church is that she has in her drawing room in, in her London residence, she has round the fireplace, she has little portraits of all her admirers, both male and female, her friends, uh, including Jefferson uh, and including Isabella um, Tiotoki Albrizzi and many others as well. Um, so Maria Cosway goes to Italy and in unfortunate circumstances in 1790 for her health because, and she's copying paintings here in Venice, this is a Titian, she also copies Tintoretto paintings in watercolour, um, because she's unexpectedly fallen pregnant in 1789 and she gives birth in May, she has a terrible pregnancy, awful birth, presumably awful postnatal depression and uh, she goes to Italy for her health, leaving her daughter um, Louisa Paulina Angelica Cosway behind with her husband and her mother and her sister. She doesn't return to London for four years. And there is Louisa painted by Richard Cosway at Lodi uh, as a baby. Um, and uh, she comes back in 1794 um, uh, when, when um, either her husband or her daughter are ill. And she comes back through revolutionary Paris and meets David, which is a difficult meeting. Um, because he's in, uh, really at full throttle with the um, terror, uh, with Robespierre's terror and is about to be imprisoned. And uh, she, she writes about this. Um, and tragically, two years later, Louisa dies of a fever. Um, and Maria Cosway's art really changes at this point. And she, um, uh, much more introspective, much more uh, allegorical, and much more uh, deeply Catholic and religious. Um, and you're seeing a, a, a drawing by her, which I identified in the collection of the British Museum, showing Cupid. Um, being challenged by the fates or Cupid challenging the fates. This was engraved by Maria Cosway later in life. Um, and there's a, there's a lot, it's in gouache, there's a lot of psychological resonances in her work of this period. Uh, in particular, this damaged but very powerful gouache and pen and ink drawing at body in the exhibition, showing a woman prostrating grief. This must be after the death of her child. And there are a whole sequence of uh, gouaches like this at Lodi. Um, in Obviously, she's back in London, she's trying to pick up her career, and then there's the tragedy of the, the death of her child. And uh, of course, this is a huge factor in her becoming an educationist, a pioneering educationist for young girls, both in Lyon in France and later in Lodi for 25 years. Uh, she did extraordinarily artistically productive, and here we have a, a small panel portrait by her of the Princess Charlotte of Wales and her daughter, um, uh, sorry, Princess Carla Caroline with her daughter, Princess Charlotte with uh, um, Britannia in the background. Um, and this was recently sold on the, on the art market in Britain with the Prince of Wales's extravagant frame with the Prince of Wales's ostrich feathers at the top. Uh, in fact, this version was, the original does survive in a private collection, but this version was retouched by Sir Thomas Lawrence, who was 
um, president of the Royal Academy after mm. Benjamin West in the 1820s, and that is actually inscribed on the back. Um, we don't know why the faces were retouched by Sir Thomas Lawrence, but it is quite mysterious. And another one of these very dramatic sketches with a woman uh, in a romantic landscape crowning a bust of Minerva, uh, reference obviously to the arts. Mm -hmm. um, and these are two of the religious compositions that she painted. The one on the left doesn't survive, it was an altarpiece for the Church of the Annunciation, it shows the Annunciation. Uh, Valentine Green uh, mezzotint after this work in the British Museum. The painting uh, doesn't survive from the it was really a church used by French Catholics in King Street off Portman Square in London. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, she does this extraordinary painting of the uh, descent from the cross. Uh, this is a colored mezzotint by Green after the painting which survives uh, in the private collection, uh, a Catholic family commission uh, in the north of England, and a version of that is at uh, the Fondazione Cosway in Lodi. Uh, extreme kind of sense of grief uh, around the, the body of Christ uh, and uh, 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 deeply uh, affecting and deeply inspired by, by, by Renaissance and Baroque models of Italian art, uh, particularly Barocci on the left with the Annunciation. But she's also produces a painting at this date, we're talking about around 1800 here, of a great masterpiece, which does survive again in a private collection of uh, the birth of the Thames, an, an extraordinary, unique uh, uh, composition in the history of art. Um, uh, again, based on Renaissance and Baroque models, mannerist, figurative models from the School of Parma uh, in the up in Gloucestershire where the Thames Seven Springs or uh, uh, and obviously running down to London and out to the North Sea uh, and showing this 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 kind of infant uh, with uh, watery infant with its naiads and the swan around it uh, an amazing conception that was that was exhibited at the Royal Academy and then engraved by in Stipple by Tompkins and actually I think it was in, exhibited in Paris as well at the Salon but I've yet to be able to to confirm that but it shows this picture was certainly engraved by Landon who was the great a promoter of the Salon in Paris uh, uh, in 1802, which must indicate that it was exhibited in, in, the, in the Salon. And it was certainly received favorable art criti uh, critics, uh, criticisms uh, in the French art press at this time. So really extraordinary achievement. Um, and Maria Cosway around 1800, one has a real change. She's 40, 41. She's, uh, her marriage is under tremendous pressure and uh, she's, uh, I think she has a lot of frustration. She's not able to join the Royal Academy. She wanting to resume. Uh, she's wanting to turn to the education of women. She's uh, she's actually about to abandon her artistic career. But just one great flourish. And these are two uh, uh, portraits by other artists of her around 1800, showing uh, the one on the right is perhaps even more. Uh, uh, of a painting that, of, a, of a portrait drawing that gives more of a sense of her great determination. Her turban is her great fashion signature. Um, and the very last painting she, she paints, is it's in a private collection in America, shows uh, the, um, a dying young woman with her uh, uh, assistance with the angel and the faith, hope and charity. So in a small panel, um, but it was uh, not exhibited in London, but it was engraved in Paris when she was there between 1801 and 1803 during the Treaty of Amiens, when there was a peace treaty, a peace truce between the French of, uh, under Napoleon and the, the British uh, Empire at this time. Um, and uh, there's only one uh, print of this that survives, about both monochrome and a colored, and they're both at Lodi. It's, it's very neoclassical and it's also quite Canovian after the, uh, and she was friends with Canova at this time as well. Um, so the, her great project in Paris was to was to copy, it was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily ambitious idea, it was to copy the layouts of the old master paintings from Italy in the Grand Gallery of the Musée Central of the Louvre in Paris. Of course, Napoleon was bringing all these pictures into the former Royal Palace, which was being converted into the great central museum of French glory, um, called the Musée Central, the Central Museum. Uh, and the great Grand Gallery had these amazing uh, uh, arrangements of the old masters. And Maria Cosby, with all the British visitors coming, she saw an opportunity, a commercial opportunity, working with a publisher called Julius Griffiths to both etch and then color uh, and then sell to subscribers in both um, English and French, uh, these uh, monochrome or colored sets of prints from the Grand Gallery of the old masters. And there you're seeing on the right, 
from her subscription volume, which survives at Lodi, uh, uh, the subscription page for the French with Bonaparte, Napoleon, and you can see Madame Mayer on the right, and Cardinal Fesch, who was her brother down below Bonaparte. The whole Bonaparte family have signed this. And it's an extraordinary document of the collaboration between the English and French artists and patrons uh, in this brief moment of peace during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but the project founded, the war began, and she fell out with her publisher, uh, and Fesh, who would become her, was becoming her patron, uh, and Madame Mayer as well gave her um, lodgings uh, in Paris. So she was working, operating at the highest levels. Vivant Denon was her great patron in the Louvre. So uh, she had to get out of Paris because she couldn't get back to Britain. Uh, and her patron in Paris, there's Fesh on the right, who's Cardinal Archbishop of Lyon, and he found her a school, uh, which had also been suppressed in the French Revolution, to re-establish a girls' school uh, uh, in Lyon. He was Archbishop of Lyon, and that's by Appiani in the, Arch in the Archbishopric of Lyon. Um, and she's uh, there for eight years. It's, uh, she works hard on the school, it's a tremendous opposition locally, and eventually it fails. And then she, her sisters are based in um, uh, near Lodi, near Milan, at Maleo, and she's by, of course, she's met Francesco Melzi Darrell in Paris, uh, who's the Duke of Lodi and the governor of the Vice uh, uh, Republic of the Cisalpine in Northern Italy. And there is uh, Melzi on the left in this superb bust by Giovanni Battista Comolli, which is in the Fondazione's Maria Cosway's collection. And he really is her great patron and provides her with the, the monastery to, to, to bring her girls' school in Italy. Uh, and she becomes one of the most famous girls' schools in, in, on a liberal educational basis. It does become Catholic later uh, in, in, in the 1820s and 1830s, really to kind of sustain the school, but it's still on Maria Cosway's educational model. And but it's, what's so interesting about Maria Cosway is that she does, even though she's long separations from her husband and, and a difficult, what became a difficult marriage, they she does always remain de devoted to him. She returns to England for five to seven years to nurse him through his final illnesses and delusions and strokes. Uh, and obviously she sells up his great collections and house and returns to Lodi with the, the proceeds and founds the, financially founds the, uh, the, the college. Um, and this is a self-portrait by him, a late self-portrait that's in the, uh, in the Fondazione, uh, sh showing him obviously with, in an oval with uh, Pittura with painting and Cupid as well. Um, and brings a lot of his heirlooms back. And there you can see a, a, by Richard Cosway, a memorial to his great friend, Robert Udney of Teddington, who was a great art collector and all the busts of the famous artists. But this embodies Richard Cosway's own attitude to the old masters. And he had a major art collection of 500 old master paintings, 2000 old master drawings, 10,000 prints and a vast library, um, particularly of, of art, obviously, but also of, uh, all the esoteric, um, uh, syncretic beliefs that he he was essentially a Christian, but uh, but was also dabbling in pretty much every aspect of the esoteric. Maria Cosway herself was a Swedenborgian in the with Richard Cosway in the 1780s, um, which was an extreme form of of millenarianism, uh, and they were both very intrigued by mesmerism too. Uh, and there is the monument uh, to, it's an engraving by, after Richard Westmacott, the monument to Richard Cosway, funded by Maria Cosway in St. Mary of Own New Church in London, uh, the plaster cast of which survives at Lodi and the monument survives in the church. Um, and she created a kind of shrine to Richard Cosway at Lodi, which is extraordinary, it doesn't survive to this day. Um, so we're coming towards the end now. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there's this extraordinary moment when both the emperor and the empress of the Austrians of Northern Italy is under Austrian control after 1815, uh, as it has been beforehand, interestingly, uh, um, and it remains under Austrian control till the 1860s, till, till the Risorgimento and Garibaldi. But um, they come and visit Milan, uh, the emperor and uh, empress, and they come and visit Lodi because there's a famous school in Milan as well, a girls' school after Maria Cosway's foundation in Lodi, uh, and, uh, the, but the Milanese elite send their, their girls to, including Alessandro Manzoni, the great Italian novelist, is uh, um, a friend of the family through his mother, Giulia Beccaria, with Maria Cosway. And this is the great book of Vellum, which is um, presenting Maria Cosway with the, uh, as a baroness of the Austrian Empire. Um, and it's in superb condition and with the wax seal that you can see in the case in the exhibition. And there is, finally, here is the tomb to Maria Cosway by Gaetano Manfredini in the church of Santa Maria della Grazia, right next to the, the convent and the school and the tomb in the foreground. 
uh, and there is the bust uh, in the, and there's another full scale bust in the college and also a painting by Gabriele Rattini, which I'm not showing here, surrounded by the teachers and the, and the, and the children in the school. So it's an extraordinary legacy. It's been hidden for a very long time, partly because of the nature of the girls' school and because the heirlooms were in the school and it wasn't an easy place to access, and it still isn't. Um, but um, she, both Richard Cosway and Maria Cosway, interest in them is gradually reviving through efforts of myself and other scholars, particularly the scholars in Lodi. And this great exhibition has been done, been curated by four of the local scholars, both in um, Lodi and in Lombardy, uh, led by Monia Faroni and Francesco Chiaroli, the president of the foundation. Um, and the catalogue, which I do recommend to you all, the, especially if you can read Italian, it would help. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it's full of wonderful material uh, and uh, using the Cos Maria Cosway's archive, she left hundreds and hundreds of letters. Um, and uh, one of Jefferson was one of her lesser correspondents. I mean, there is a vast correspondence with Cardinal Fesch, General Pasquale Paoli, the great Corsican Patrick was her major intimate correspondent in the 1780s. Um, and as I've mentioned before, uh, she corresponded with many artists and, and other women, um, musicians and artists um, uh, and intellectuals um, uh, and architects, Sir John Soane, there's a major correspondence um, at the Soane Museum uh, from later life, Francis Dowse, the great art collector, book collector in, based in uh, London. Uh, that correspondence survives, uh, correspondence with the, the um, Etcho, Francesco Rosa Spina, that's still to be investigated, Pierre Hugues Doncaville, the Baron, the so-called Baron Doncaville, one of the leading antiquarian archaeologists of the period, uh, his letters to her survive. So, and her diary from Paris survives for three years, which is being edited at the moment by the um, Fondazione Cosway, uh, and that is a personal diary recording not everyone that she meets, um, and also her feelings about not only those she meets on both the French and the British visitors to Paris, but also her own feelings. So it's a remarkable testament at this point of kind of transition in her life between, between being a figure of society of the mundane uh, in Paris and London to uh, devoting herself uh, for the rest of her life, for the next uh, 37 years to the cause of female education. It's, it's, it's an inspiring story and there's a lot more to tell. Thank you. Stephen, um, this is all fascinating. I'm afraid we try very hard to stay on time, so I'm afraid we're going to be out of time for any questions. We had started a few minutes late. It does demonstrate, I think, the uh, nature of fellowships. And when we talk about studying Jefferson or Jefferson era, the breadth of material that's covered, because if we want to understand that era, we need to understand the art and the music and the artists and the musicians, such as Mariah Causeway. Um, for our guests who are online, this is being recorded and we will have it available on our ICGS website if you want to uh, listen to it again, because Stephen was going over so much information and so many pieces of, of art that you might want to tune back in. But with that, we'll look forward to seeing you all in the next time we have a fellows talk. And Stephen, thank you so much for the information. Thank you.